Hey folks, welcome to Pro Trader Strategies. My name is Eric Wilkinson, and this is basically our webinar on swing trades using options. Now I do a daily spotting the trade where I actually go through the markets and then talk about option strategies that I find to implement into my portfolio. And these, what I'm trying to do for you folks is help you streamline that process in order to find the right strategy for any given assumption. We don't go into a specific day and think, geez, I need to put on a short put butterfly today. No, what happens is I put on a, I look at the markets and I put on a trade based on my assumption. Okay, so the assumption with this would be a pop or a drop, but what I want to do for you folks is make sure we're working in this mechanically. So I've created structure for you folks in order to finitely follow a guideline to find the right strategy, okay? So ultimately, we start out the day, we're flipping through our charts, maybe even getting ready for tomorrow, preparing, and we come up with a scenario in our head, well, hey, I think this market in this underlying is either gonna shoot to the moon or just fall out of bed and fall flat on its face. For whatever reason, you come up with that assumption. What I'm here to do is help you find that right strategy for that assumption. So if this is something you're interested in, please hit that subscribe button and right next to it, there should be a little bell. Most people miss this little bell indicator because if you click on that, if I pop in here sometime where I'm not really announcing it ahead of time, you guys will get notification when that happens. For instance, in those spot the trade videos that I do in the early morning where they're live, but I'm trying to get in and give you guys real time what's happening in my portfolio and or in the market. So that doesn't always happen exactly at 11.30 Eastern, and that's the time I've scheduled for that. Sometimes I'm gonna come in right after the open and say, hey, let's start covering some of these trades. They look good right now. Uh, we need to get out of these, and I wanna be in uh, the heat of the moment with you folks. So please make sure you're subscribing. And if you have any takeaways whatsoever that you think that might be beneficial to somebody else out there, smash that like button because what that does is it really is like feeding these little bots. You're throwing them a little cookie and that bot runs out there and tries to find another person that looks just like you to share this information with. And if you have any questions, comments, or anything else you want me to cover, throw it over there in the questions box. This is for you folks. If you guys have questions, reach out in the questions box. I'm gonna make sure I try to answer those as quickly as possible. And keep in mind, if you have a question out there, folks, somebody else has that same question. So go ahead and throw it out there. Even if you think that there's something maybe I may have misspoke and caused confusion, again, throw it over there. I'll make sure I clarify anything before we go forward. All right, so without further ado, let's get on with this. Uh, swing trades using options. And let me share my screen here, uh, make sure we get this going. So this is gonna be on the pop or drop, folks. We don't know necessarily what direction this underlying is going to head. So that's why we come up with the pop or drop scenario. Sometimes we just don't know. We just have a feeling that this underlying is going to shoot north or just fall flat on its face. So enter the short put butterfly. Now, keep in mind, the butterfly is a bit of a different um, beast compared to what we normally talk about with option strategies. So there's some nuances with the butterfly. It's kind of like a caterpillar. It can kind of change a little bit, morph uh, compared to what some of our other strategies guidelines are. So we'll talk about those nuances here today, but keep in mind the short put butterfly, it can either take off to the moon or fall flat on its face. That's how we're going to profit here. We're going to lean towards because it's a short put, to a bullish move. If we add more of, say, you know, you're thinking it's a pop or drop 50-50, right? 50-50 probability. Well, then maybe in this scenario, I'm about 60-40 bullish to bearish, okay? Last week, we talked about the short call butterfly, and that I talked about we're a little bit more bearish than we would be bullish. And I'll talk about why that is in this video uh, a little bit later on, but just keep in mind with the short put butterfly, we are leaning a little bit towards uh, the risk is to the upside for this market, okay? But it is ultimately going to be the short put butterfly, but let's put that on the shelf for a moment 
and really go through this process like we would on a, any given day to find the right option strategy. All right, in the very beginning, we talked about swing trades. So some of you folks might be like, hey, I came on here to talk about options or learn about options, and now he's talking about swing trades. Well, you get a bang, double bang for your buck here. First off, we need to talk about what is swing trading. Ultimately, swing trading is as simple as this. It's any trade that lasts longer than a day. <laughs> so a day trade is a trade I get in and out of today. A swing trade is something where I am looking out into the future for this uh, to come to fruition, all right? So uh, multiple days, if you will. So a swing trade, what we're looking for is three step process for this swing trade. First, pro first step in the process is discerning whether or not it is a bullish move, is the underlying rallying, is it stuck in a market neutral type pattern? And we've talked about this with Intel not too long ago as a neutral pattern. Uh, and is it in somewhat of a bearish pattern, okay? That's the first step is to figure out the overarching maybe 52 week uh, period and figure out is it overarching bullish, overarching market neutral or overarching bearish, okay? The broader term, uh, general swing, all right? You can do this breaking it down on a day pattern um, for swing trades within the day, day trades, but I'm going to specifically um, focus on those trades that last longer than a day, all right? So the first thing we've done is determine our directionality. The next thing we have to do is discern what the support and resistance is. And the way we do that is in that overall trend, we are looking for different areas of where we found support and resistance. For instance, you know, if you glaze your eyes, you can see, well, that underlying lost momentum to the upside and gained support to the downside, all right? Support and resistance. And then again, you know, this one has a little bit of an eyeball where it's not always even. Well, you're going to try and hit as many as you can as that resistance and then find that support, okay? Sometimes it will breach. Uh, resistance, support, okay? So you're going to glaze your eyes. I'll show you a couple other ways we can look at Fibonacci's and bring up our own trend channels. Uh, I'll show you how to do some of those things briefly in here. Uh, and then... We found our trend, we found our support and resistance. Now we're looking for the pattern within the trend. So we have a bullish trend. We're gonna be concentrating on that momentum shift. In this case, it hit up against resistance and now we have a bearish pattern setting up. On this one, neutral trend, bullish pattern setting up. This one has a bearish trend with a bullish pattern setting up, okay? Now, we're gonna base our trade off of what our directional assumption is, you know, and it can be like this where it kind of goes like that and you think, all right, this thing has really tightened up, okay? And when it, I talk about it in spotting the trades, when I see opportunities for a pop or a drop, it's usually when you've seen the underlying make these big up and down moves and then all of a sudden it starts tightening up and getting, a little bit tighter ranges. And the way I kind of correlate that is the old balsa wood airplanes where you take a rubber band and you start wrap, you use the propeller to tighten up that rubber band. Well, the more and more you wrap up that rubber band, the tighter and tighter it gets. It's building up energy. And then when you release the, or the blade, it really spins if you wound it up for a long period of time. Very similar in nature, to what's happening in the markets. When you see the underlying tighten up, it's really bulls and bears banging it out. And sooner or later, one of those guys is gonna win and we're gonna get a pop in one of the directions. We don't always know. We can kind of feel our way through it. Maybe we have a, an assumption with what the um, company is doing that maybe it's a little bit more bullish, but we're worried about uh, that new product might fail, okay? Uh, and therefore it might fall. New product might really do well or it might fall flat on its face, okay? So determine now 
Do I think it's got a better chance of popping the upside? If so, then we're gonna use the short put butterfly in this case. And if we had a worry of the downside a little bit more, then that's when we would look at that last week's uh, strategy on the short put or short call, sorry, short call calendar, all right? So this is really kind of like what I'm looking for is either a pop or a drop and the pattern doesn't always give us an indication of that. We're gonna be looking for just the, the overall market to tighten up a little bit there. All right, so in this case, what do we have going on? We have, if you, can, you can kind of blur your eyes even on something like this. We have what looks to be like a bullish market overall trend. Now I can, even before I add these lines in there, you could even draw that line where I have it or maybe even a little bit tighter on this line, okay, as resistance. And you can see where I found some support. Now, a lot of times what I will say with when drawing trend channels in some of my other classes where we're talking about that is to hit as many of the tops as you can and as many of the bottoms as you can. It doesn't always have to be the bottom of the wick or any of that stuff, but try and just kind of glaze your eyes and hey, it's right in there. And that is just fine, folks. You can do that, all right? In this case, what I have here is I was trying to hit the major moves to the downside and the upside. Uh, you're gonna have less opportunities, but those opportunities will usually be a little bit um, better okay in this case what do we have well we have a market neutral right market looks for the past 52 weeks in this underlying that it is traded completely sideways and again you could have picked this line in the sand for your resistance and supports or go to the outside ones right not as many opportunities on those further out ones but higher probabilities most likely okay so again, and in this case, I would be keying in on the pattern reversal off of that candle. So when we're looking for these different types of reversals in the pattern, what I want you to key in on are uh, candlesticks. I like to use candlesticks that look like a hammer, a spinning top, all right, which means the only difference is, is it's got a little bit of a wick there, a hangman where it's basically, uh, off the top like that, or has a little wick at the top. You can go with those types of red candles at the top and bottom of moves. And this is individuals. I'm not trying to group these together, okay? If you're starting to group these together and they start looking like this, that's one of those things we're looking for as a pop or a drop. And they can be red or they can be even green. It doesn't matter. They, they actually are giving us the same type of indications if they look like this uh, as like the hammer, the spinning top, uh, the hangman doji, okay? Those at the top and bottoms of the moves, all mutually exclusive, all right? Um, and when you would get something like them all jammed up where it looks like those topping patterns are all like in a line, that's where you're starting to see that rubber band get wound tighter, all right? Um, and they're gonna get that popper of, a drop. So those are the types of candles I'm looking for to really base my pattern reversal on. Now, if it's at the top of a move, like in this case here that we're talking about again, I would want to see a red candle right next to it the next day. That's confirmation. So these candles that we were talking about before, these are all set up candles here and then this would be the confirmation of a top and pattern reversal, okay? Bottom of the move, pattern reversal, confirmation of the upside. Another one that you can also keep your eye out for uh, is a rare one, is one that looks just like that. That's a tombstone doji, and those at the top and bottom of a move are significant. Inside of a move, you know, like inside the middle zones here, that's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for those kind of candles at the tops uh, or bottoms of moves here, okay? But again, here we have an overall bearish uh, trend. Find the support and resistance. Find the resistance and find the support, okay? And then in this case, 
looking for a candle like this for a pattern reversal, okay? Everybody with me so far? Did that even, if, hey, if you guys st enjoying this, smash that like button for me right now. Feed those bots, get them out there. Find people like you to come and enjoy this as well. All right, well, we talked about the swing trade setups, all of those things. Does it always work out? No, no it doesn't. Sometimes we look at this and say, all right, I'm an aggressive trader and boom, I did not wait for, remember that red candle? I said we would want a red candle the next day. Well, we did not get that red candle. We got our green candle that erased that setup, all right? So aggressive traders will a lot of times enter their trade on that setup candle, the hangman dojis, the uh, tombstone dojis like that, they, but, they don't, uh, newer traders should wait for the confirmation, all right? Higher probability trade then, all right? Um, you'll get more opportunities if you don't wait for it and sometimes better strike location, but you're also increasing your risk parameter a little bit because it's not gotten that confirmation. Uh, but another thing with this, uh, with these trades, when we're setting them up and following these guidelines that I'm laying out for you folks, you were able to yes, we got involved in this, but we were at our strike location way up here and we were selling calls because we had really high volatility. Um, and with that, we had higher probabilities of success. Now, a lot of times if you were doing this as a swing trade, just doing short the underlying, well, this would have been a very painful learning experience to not uh, get involved in a trade before the confirmation. But the beauty in options is our strike location will allow us to be so much further away, uh, especially on short calls and stuff like that, that our probabilities of success are, are much better. We can have or we can sustain a little bit of a move against us as long as some of the other levers and pulleys in our strategy start working in our favor, all right? So that would be like, yeah, this directionality was completely in my face because it started rallying, but if volatility started coming out at the same time, then I could be very successful with this trade, despite the fact that I can't pick a directional move to save my life, okay? So you have that. You know, a lot of times what we do is we're getting involved in trades based on, you know, I think this is right. So you have a little bit of doubt in your head. And then you go, okay, I'm gonna put on this option strategy. And because you've learned a little bit about option strategies enough to get you in trouble, that you have a little bit of doubt in there. And that is going to cause you to get out of the trade at you know the wrong time, if you will. You know, in a directional move against you, you're just thinking the move is against me. I called it wrong. In the meantime, maybe volatility is really coming out. So my goal is ultimately to get you folks to understand these levers and pulleys, and that will get you thinking mechanically with structure. We're following a structure uh, that I've laid out for you guys, and when the structure is broken, then we rip, pull the ripcord, we get up, all right? Because we're following a finite guideline, if you will, however you wanna think about it, all right? I've gotten, guidelines, rules, whatever you want, structure, however you want to think about it, this is what I'm trying to do for you so that when you get in and out of these strategies, it's not emotional. When we're trading, there's so many times, folks, where we're trading because, or sorry, not because, we're trading and we are correlating in our heads, I need to make this much money on this, or I'm making this much money on this. And if you're doing that, you're breaking down on your mechanical process, all right? Because you're allowing emotion to get into the picture. We wanna separate emotion from everything and start thinking about this mechanically. If the pattern breaks down, the structure breaks down, I get out, all right? If you start getting emotional about it, pull the ripcord, get out of it. Trade something you have no idea what it's, what it, actually manufactures or produces or has a service for, right? You're almost sometimes better off not having so much analysis paralysis that you're constantly second guessing yourself. Follow a structure, follow the plan, okay?
Does that make sense to everybody? Throw it over there in the comments box. Let me hear from you, folks. Let me know you're alive. I feel like I need CPR going. Let's do this thing. All right. So it will break down sometimes. Again, we've got a bullish pattern. Look, it, how many times it's bounced on that support level? It's got to do it again this time. Well, not always. This is just last night. We've seen that during the last couple of weeks, that structure has broken down. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't always work, but had you gone into this trade for a year and been playing this on this trend channel that's years and years old that we've just finally gotten back into, you know, there's an opportunity, opportunity, winner, winner, chicken, dinner on the downside. So, you know, like the sixth time it finally broke through, which is probably in line with the probabilities, okay? Um, as a matter of fact, it's probably dead on the probabilities. Uh, again, it broke out, but there was never really a confirmation to come back up into that area. So really this wouldn't have been a trade to get involved in, but an aggressive trader like myself would have gotten involved in it when it pounced on that bottom line. Now, um, selling puts or something like that, depending on what the strategy was for this trade, you know, you can sustain a move like this. As a matter of fact, we did have some short puts in here. Now that I'm thinking about it, is I had sold the puts down here at like the 415 area. So I was selling puts down here based on a bounce on here. Yeah, it started breaking down a little bit, had another support level on that 50 day simple moving average, but this ended up uh, being a winning trade when we were selling those puts. And I was doing this in the spot the trade videos, those morning videos. A lot of times what I'll do is talk about a strategy here and I'm telling you folks like, don't go into the day thinking I've got to put on this strategy. Well, I do do that because I want to talk about a strategy here in this video and then that's on the assumption that, you know, as long as everything still looks the same tomorrow, then I'm gonna implement that strategy uh, in and around the time that you guys would be. I don't wanna put on a trade today and say, I put this trade on, you guys should go do that too. I don't do that. And I will never tell you, I think you guys should put on this or a strategy on any given day. If I'm putting on a strategy, you need to think about it for yourself. Is this in line with my risk parameters, especially when I'm selling naked puts? All right. And, uh, you know, maybe you would do the put spread in that case. All right. So a little bit of a review, right? How do we swing trade? What's the first step? Anybody? I'll give you a second to type. Some of you guys type faster. First step is identify the trend. Second step, support and resistance, right? Next step is what we are basing our strategy on, the pattern, the pattern within the overall trend. So bearish trend, you know, we're looking for that pattern. In this case, we're kind of looking for something like that or just an idea in and around this underlying, like we think it's going to pop or a drop. And why do we use options? Well, I talked about this. You're gonna have better probabilities when you have your strike location well outside of where we're the realm of possibility in the case, where in this case, where I was talking about selling uh, calls against this one, my strike location was up here above the second resistance area. Yeah, it did break through it a little bit, um, but we got another pattern reversal indicator. This one did get confirmed, right? That one got confirmed to the downside. So, a, you know, a lower risk tolerant person, I would suggest waiting for that confirmation. Those are the ones that usually end up following through. The ones that don't get confirmed like this one, you can see can be, can become very painful. And if you were doing this with a short like shorting the underlying, that would have been very painful on that move. You would have been out as soon as it broke above that Fibonacci, hopefully right here. Uh, as soon as we got above that, hopefully that's where you would have pulled that ripcord because the rule is if it looks like it's going to settle above that previous day's top, 
it looks like today is going to settle above that, I guess, then uh, that's time to pull the ripcord on that trade, staying mechanical. <clears throat> Again here, once it breaks down, can't get back in there, pull the ripcord on it. This has broken down, uh, especially if you're doing this with shorting the underlying, right? Or getting long the underlying in this case, um, then you're trying to get long this. You need to have that move happen. It starts down ticking, that's gonna be painful. But in this case with options and having high volatility uh, during the time when we set this up, I think we set it up like right around in here when we were thinking we were gonna bounce back after it broke out. Well. We didn't, we did start trending sideways. I got the directionality wrong, but like I said, I was selling puts at the 415 strike. I would be happy to get long right there at the point of control. I talked about the reasons why in the spotting the trades, but we did get volatility coming out, directionality against me, but my strike location was very uh, nice and allowed me to stay mechanical on this. So really, we're trying to increase our probabilities of success here. All right, so this is one that I'm looking at. Remember what I talked about after it makes those big moves, like we can see on this one, right, where uh, it's made some nice moves, juking back and forth. Like this underlying doesn't usually look like it stays very still, but all of a sudden, boom, we start getting that little windup. Yes, it is right around the point of control. And generally speaking, I don't love getting involved in a pop or drop situation when it first gets to that point of control. One thing is we've got this big earnings thing down here, right? What happens around earnings? We usually expect volatility to start increasing, okay? So that's something that we have as a known, kind of like in geometry, we have some knowns. Well, it's it's a known-ish in option. So usually we see volatility increase heading into one of these big events, like an earnings event. Why? Because it's a big unknown. And anytime there's unknown, there is angst. And angst really is volatility, folks. It's, it's uh, you know, worry, fear of missing out, all of those things. Um, so we will see volatility usually rise heading into a earnings. Okay. Now, with this particular underlying, I have a bit of a thesis going on heading into this earnings. We've seen this year a lot of opening up of online gambling for uh, sports bets, all right? And I know where I'm from, we didn't have legalized gambling online. Now, we, how you doing out there, LOL? Uh, now we are starting to see that a little bit of a different story, right? Now we're starting to see it show up a, a little bit differently. And with this one, or with this one, what we're seeing is all of these states are opening up. And I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of buddies that are going hog wild on taking their opportunity to sports bet online. Having said that, you know, DraftKings was given like $1,000 to everybody uh, who put in their first sports bet, all right? What does that tell you? If they're gonna give every single person that opens up an account $1,000, they probably think that they can at least make $2,000 off of everybody signing up, right? The $1,000 they gave you back and probably cashing out for another $1,000. Why are they giving you $1,000? They want you to bet bigger. They want you to get used to betting big, okay? $1,000 is just chump change, somebody might think, all right? And therefore, they get you hooked, all right? They're, they're, the, they're the, the crack salesman of this century, I guess. Um, anyway, but with that said, I think that they are going to pop, but I am worried about my thesis that only it's my degenerate friends that are making <laughs> making these bets. All right, I don't I don't bet. I I would rather bet on stuff like this where I have higher probabilities myself. Um, but each to each his own. 
I am then probably like 60. I'm probably more 75 to 25, but let's just say now I'm 60, 40. I, I believe the upside is more imminent than the downside, but I am uh, wanting to cover that base, okay? So that's how I come up with my pop or drop. However you guys come up with your pop or drop, just kind of think I need to add some type of structure-ish to it. And when I say structure, I'm not saying you have to follow this to the T because it's not always to the T, folks. It's a little bit of wiggle room in there. Uh, it's a little bit of a wag, if you will, uh, to get there, all right? So I'm gonna come up with some other guidelines, like I might say a specific delta, and we don't always have that specific delta, all right? And I'll, show, I'll explain that and how we manage that. Uh, process as well. All right. Now we kind of know why we want to use options, higher probabilities. It allows us to stay mechanical. We can have structure around it. Very difficult to build structure around a uh, just an underlying buying long, getting short that day. Okay. It's really a 50-50 toss of the coin uh, at any given day when we're doing that. So I'm trying to add structure here for you guys. But before we do that, we kind of know, need to know a little bit about what we're talking about. So what are what is an option? It is a contract between two people. And you can think about it as it's like insurance or anything else, but really it's a contract between you and I. And if I am the call buyer, I have the right but not the obligation to buy that stock at the strike that I purchased, all right? I have the right but not the obligation. So in that, like if we're talking about XYZ, an underlying, XYZ here is trading $100, okay? Now, I buy a call at the 105 strike. Now this call, buying this call allows me or grants me the right to buy XYZ at $105 because that's my strike, 105 strike right? That allows, I buy that right, I pay a dollar for it or something, I pay for that right to buy XYZ at 105. Do I want to do it when XYZ is trading 100? No, I hope not. I hope you don't. Because you can go out there in the open market and buy it for a hundred dollars. Yeah, you got that call that you paid a dollar for, you're going to, you know, whatever. If it goes up, then it might change your mind. Because if XYZ starts now going up and is trading 195, I still have the right, but not the obligation, to buy XYZ stock at 105 bucks, right? I paid a dollar for it, but I can now exercise my right to buy the stock at $105, okay? Now, sidebar. Can we have a sidebar real quick? I don't wanna confuse you, but don't ever go through the assignment process, okay? The reason why is because in this day and age, we can go out there and buy stock for zero commissions, all right? We can buy and sell options pretty cheap. This assignment process, is pretty expensive, all right? So let's not go through the, uh, my point, no, I was doing that right. The sign-up process is a little bit of an expense, all right? And the other reason why I don't want you guys to do that is you're gonna be leaving money on the table, all right? And I'm gonna briefly explain this. When we have an option that is now in the money, this option is now in the money if we're trading 195, Options that are, call options that are below where the underlying is trading. So I've got a call down here and the underlying trading up there. However, I'm trying to look at the mirror image. All right. That, this call has immense value. Why? Because it has to include the value between my strike price and where the underlying is trading. What's that difference? $90, all right? So it has to at least include that benefit. So if I go through the exercise process 
The stock goes into my account at 105. It looks great on the PL when it's trading 195. I got $90 of value, right? So that seems pretty enticing, but the price of this uh, strike has to include the benefit, meaning it has to at least be worth $90 already. So if I just sell the option, I know that at least I've gotten that much value in it. And oftentimes there's going to be some extra money in there. There's going to be like an extra $2 because it might be actually $92 for that to actually buy or sell that 105 strike now because there's $2 of theta or volatility kind of packed in there still, all right? So if $2 doesn't mean anything to you, keep in mind when we're trading options, there is an option contract multiplier of 100. So you're leaving $200 on the table. And if you went through the assignment process, you left that $200 on the table, meaning you just didn't care about it, and you paid $35 to go through this fund process, so really, you left 235 on the table, folks. That's pretty expensive learning lesson, all right? So offset them, go out there. Who cares if your P&L doesn't have that $90 in it? It's going to have it banked, all right? You're taking that cash off the table, that extra $2 you won't ever be able to lose now, all right? That extra $2 being that theta decay, the $92. All right, so the call seller, because he got that premium, he collected a premium, has the obligation to deliver the stock. So you can kind of think of it as the option seller is kind of like the insurance company um, where they collect a premium, you know, like you're giving them $10 a month on your, for your uh, term life insurance for a million dollars or something, right? Well, you're not paying out very much as the person paying for the premium to receive a nice big windfall in the case of a call buyer trying to make that big windfall on the move higher. Whereas the call seller is usually a little bit more math oriented, maybe an actuarial scientist or something. And he's looking at it like the probabilities of that happening are so small, I'm willing to take your money. Okay, and that's exactly what an insurance company does. They're looking at your probabilities and determining what they need to be paid for that risk. Same thing for a call seller, okay? And as things get crazy, what happens with that call seller? It's like, you gotta pay a lot more because I'm not willing to take that risk, all right? And the put buyer has the right but not the obligation to sell that stock. So for instance, if I buy the, uh, do I still have my pen? If I buy the put below the market, right? So I'm buying a put, I buy the 90 put, that gives me the right but not the obligation to sell the stock at not, or sell that stock at 90. When it's trading 100, do I want to do that? No way. I'm selling it at 100 right now. Boom. Right? But if it goes down to zero, do I want to sell that stock at 90? You bet your bottom dollar I do. But again, it's the same situation, folks. Uh, the assignment process is going to be costly. Better to offset your trades if you really want it, all right? Um, so uh, if you are the put seller, you're willing to buy it there. You are going to take delivery, all right? If I say, yes, I want out of my stock at 90, I bought this put, right? It goes into that dude's account at 90. He's long, you're out, you got that problem. You go through that assignment process, no, you left money on the table. I don't even care if it's the last day. There's still probably a dime, a nickel in there uh, based on you know anything being able to happen sometime soon. So don't go through that assignment process, offset them, Create that position. Everybody with me right now? Hey, if that, guys, if that was beneficial, please smash that like button if you haven't already because that will share this information with somebody else that the uh, bots thinks 
could benefit. So please help those folks out. All right. Now we've talked about pricing, right? I've talked about if I'm a call buyer, I have to pay a premium for something. If I'm a call seller, I get to collect that premium. So there's obviously pricing and options, but we have to determine whether or not these options are cheap or expensive, right? So what I want to do is go look at this underlying pre, uh, options page. This is the option montage, for lack of a better word. I'm, that's what I call it. Uh, so if you ever hear me say montage, that's this page. So it's where all the pricing is. Now, when we're trying to determine whether or not options are expensive or cheap, we have to look at what the implied volatility is for that underlying, all right? Anybody know what implied volatility is? It's forward looking volatility. It's what the expectation of future volatility is, right? Historical volatility is what just happened. I would rather be forward looking, right? I want to look out forward and say, this is what I expect, okay? Or this is what we are expecting going forward. All implied volatility is folks, implied volatility, I'm just gonna do vol is Vega. Now you're gonna find Vega on the put side and the call side, Vega, all right? So what happens with all of these groups, right? Let's just get rid of all the mystique around these groups. They're really not that scary. Anytime we're talking about Greeks, we are talking about advancement, okay? Um, meaning the underlying moves higher by a dollar. One day goes by volatility increases by one percentage point, all right? So it's an increase of one, all right? So if we have decreases, the underlying starts going down, we have to add a negative to all of this, all right? So if volatility goes up, we're looking at the Vega by goes up by one percentage point, right? What happens? Vega goes into our premiums. So if this went from 59 to 60.02, exactly one percentage point, boom, one cent goes into our premiums. Out here further in time, we still have Vega. This would be basically popping up to 59, right? Now, what we would see is five cents goes into that premium. I'm looking at the puts here. Uh, in this case, nine cents on one percentage point, okay? So an advancement, same thing up here. Vega, boom, increases, adds in. Now what happens when we go, see volatility going down? It goes down by one percentage point. What happens to Vega? It's a negative plus a positive means a negative. It's a negative to those premiums then. All right, everybody follow me? We on the same page? All right, and same thing for the other Greeks. You know, you can see uh, delta on the calls is positive. Delta on the puts is negative, right? So if the underlying starts moving down, what happens to that delta? A negative plus a negative is a positive. So it's a positive to our premiums if the underlying is going down on the put side. It's a ne it becomes a negative on the call side if the underlying moves down because a negative plus a positive is a positive, right? Make sense? All right, thumbs up, smash the thumb. Hey, seriously, if I'm losing folks, throw it over there in the comment section. All right, so we can't just look at these numbers and determine whether or not volatility is high or low based on that number, 59. I look at 59, oh my God, Tesla is up in the hundreds. This has got to be low volatility for DraftKings? No. We need to compare apples to apples. And the only way to do that really is to kind of chart it up. And one of the things we will know about implied volatility, especially as a chart, is that it's like a swing trade. So we're trying to identify swing trades within the implied volatility area. So down here, I have a chart of implied volatility. 
And you can see that that's that 59 number we were looking at over there in the option montage, okay? It shows up here. So what we do is we can see that this kind of looks like, you know, what we were looking at with a, a regular swing type trade. And we can determine support and resistances here. Like where does the top happen? Top happens there, bottom happens there. And you guys might be going, dude, you missed something. Well, that was last year, really, or back during the height of the pandemic when we didn't know if there was going to be an earth with humans left in it, right? So, of course, volatility was extremely high. And now that we've kind of seen that it's not going to wipe out the entire face of the earth, well, we probably won't get up to that volatility again. So, and remember, that volatility wasn't, the, the pandemic volatility was higher than the financial, or even if you were long enough to trade the dot-com bubble, all right? Those volatility coefficients weren't anything close to what we saw here during the pandemic. So we, we used to call this a black swan event on the floor. It's not probably going to happen for another 20 years, 10, 20 years, 30 years, okay? So we can't have that constantly being uh, evaluated in our process because it was a, a one-off kind of thing, all right? So I want to discount everything that happened there and look at basically April going forward, all right? So the last six months. Now, I've gotten to a point where I put this in my watch list as implied volatility percent. You'll see implied volatility percent if you're trading on uh, uh, TD Ameritrade, Thinkorswim, in a lot of different places. Um, more often than you'll see volatility. Uh, so all of those things, what we're trying to do is really just determine where we are right now in relation to that range. Because if this volatility number is at that low end of the range, that very low end of the range, we know those premiums are the cheapest they've been all year, right? Or very close to the cheapest they've been. Why do I say that? Because volatility as it fluctuates is the major determining factor for pricing in that option montage, all right? So as volatility is spiking at its high, we can therefore make that correlation that, hey, volatility is at its highest, therefore premiums are at their highest. Volatility is at their lowest, we can assume volatility or premiums are at their lowest. Now, that's not to say that it's not going to break out of this range. It will happen, okay? It can continue. I'm not guaranteeing anything, but more often than not, we will see that when it gets overextended to the upside, it wants to revert, okay? So we're looking for those types of situations. We are trying to not only determine the direction of the underlying, we want to determine the direction of the volatility because if we understand that volatility, we will stay mechanical. We can follow our structure, okay? Follow these guidelines. All right, so I'm zooming in here, right? This is that same implied volatility without all the other noise on it. I also want to take out, I said, all of this noise, whoops, outside of that April. So I wanna take that out and try and clip as many, or clip the highs and clip the lows, right? So, I, I'm determining this is 75 there. We know this is 59 and a half right here. And then here I'm gonna be looking at this as being, let's just call it 50 for math, all right? So with the with the, um, the script, like my six month script, Think or Swim's 52 week script, basically what it does is it takes where the current is, the current implied volatility is, and you subtract and it subtracts the low. All right. That sum really is trying to determine where this location is off of that low. All right. And then we take that and divide it by the high implied volatility. This is only if you really want to dig into the details, folks. You don't have to get this finite. Um, 
So a high minus a low then determines the range, right? Where we are within that entire range. So I've got the current minus the low is, uh, let's call it nine and a half, 9.5 divided by 25. And that gives me right around 36 percentile. All right. I usually say below here is buy signal. Up here is sell signal. All right. But I mentioned butterflies are a bit of a different beast, right? It's a short, but uh, I want volatility to be low. Yes, because it's the nature of the beast, the way I set the strategy up, and I'll explain that a little bit further. No, with this strategy, though, it is a short put butterfly. So we are leaning towards a bullish move. We will profit just as well from a fall to fall on your face, scorpion crash. Scorpion is where you fall on your face and your feet come up and clip you in the back of the head. Um, or a blast to the moon like uh, William Shatner did today with Blue Origin, right? So that's the kind of scenario. We're looking for the blast, but it might be a scorpion. All right, so that's the, this is, devil of the details this is it look i'm i'm down here uh volatility is pretty cheap so with the short put butterfly it is a short put butterfly and the only thing that really follows suit is the fact that it's a short put and we've got a bullish assumption usually when we are shorting something we want volatility to come out well with this strategy we actually want volatility to expand and the reason why is because the two strikes that we're buying are going to be affected by that volatility coefficient more than the other ones. So if volatility expands, it will have it will help the ones that we bought. And I'll show you how that works out. Uh, we'll show you how that shakes out. All right. So in this case, we determine that they're pretty cheap-ish, right? It's a little bit in the and do we buy options? Well, no, we aren't buying options in this case. We are, we're gonna collect the credit, but the ones that are affected by the volatility are those strikes that we are buying. And I'll show you how that works out. First, let's talk about this thief though, that we want to avoid. All right, if you have the thief come into the picture, it's basically, uh, I'd like to call it about 45 days to expiration and in. All right. That's usually the buy or the, sorry, the sell zone. All right. And this is the buy zone. We want to limit theta decay out here, right? You can see how aggressive theta drops here. And out here, it'll kind of trickle a little bit flat. It will never get exactly flat. There's always going to be a millionth of a, uh, a penny that starts ramping up to, you know, a hundred thousandth of a penny. Okay, so that increasing. But it will feel like it flattens out to further out in time. And theta is that thief in the night that comes and steals your premiums, folks. He will never stop. It will constantly pick at your pocket and get more and more aggressive. So 45 days to expiration is really where we see theta get uh, aggressive and inside that 35 days, really aggressive. So now again, we're doing a butterfly. Remember it morphs. It is a short put butterfly. The only thing that really holds constant here is we want a lean towards the bullish move. Selling zone. That's when we want the thief on their side, but we are going to get out here in time because of the nature of this strategy. The, the two strikes that we are buying are all extrinsic value. We're gonna sell one that is in the money and that one is where we collect that big fat credit that pays for the entire strategy, okay? So that's what kind of flips the, uh, this strategy to make it an upside down cake rather than a regular cake. So let's get on with it and talk about this theta. Further out, theta affects the nearer duration options more than the further duration options. 
So this is SPY <clears throat> calls. We've got theta puts. We've got theta. One thing you'll notice about theta is it's always negative, right? It's an advancement. These Greeks are an advancement. Do you ever go back in time? Do you ever wake up and it's yesterday? No. So theta is a constant erosion of your premiums. You can take advantage of it. Like if you sell something, you want theta to help you out and like, hey, take 50 cents from this premium, right? Um, but further out in time, you can see it's less. Because for instance, this is 128. What happens 28 days later? Theta really doesn't look like an increase. It's not flat. Note that if this was, you know, zero, zero after here, uh, you know, running out the decimals, these are rounded up. This one is actually probably, uh, you know, zero, one, one. Okay. So it's a rounding thing. But you can see you ramp up now from uh, looking at this 32 days, right? So 32, 37 days, it's in that wheelhouse of theta, and we saw how it started ramping up already. Well, theta here is 10 cents. What happens when we move in 30 some odd days? Quadrupling theta. So those options that we're buying at the money, we want to limit that theta decay for them as much as we can. All right. So let's take a look at ours, our theta kind of, erosion same thing 28 days here we're looking at and you move in 30 days from here basically 128 to 100 and our theta in this column increased ever so slightly now let's look at 30 days to basically uh you know it's a it's a few more days don't get me wrong but that few more days is not going to make theta look like that, right? We can see that this is a massive increase in theta. So I want to avoid that. I do not want to buy my at the money options with that kind of theta decay. Because the ones that we are selling to collect the premium for, folks, they don't have a whole lot of theta in there, all right? It's going to be more the... Um, the actual intrinsic value, that benefit that we are entitled to, okay? That pays for this strategy. All right, so we want the short put butterfly. Slightly bullish assumption, but I worried about the downside, so I wanna hedge my risk to the downside in case, you know, my, all my friends are geniuses and they're actually running the uh, tables on DraftKings better okay i doubt that's happening but you know we can always hope for them <laughs> all right so i've talked about this the rate of change right delta tells us the rate of change for the dollar move higher right a dollar move higher delta tells us that our premiums are going to jack up in the calls by that much and a dollar higher our premiums and the puts are going to lose that much right but more importantly, what I want you to take away from Delta is not only is it going to change the premiums, all right, for every dollar move higher or lower, we need to know that for, you know, pricing, but it's data. And when I'm trying to tell you folks that we need to be mechanical and stay with structure, this is how we're going to do it because Delta tells us data. It tells us the probabilities, right? It or odds, the odds of the trade, right? It tells us, um, it allows us to know what the probability of touch is. And this is a floor trader thing. It's two times that delta. During what delta tells us, not only the rate of change, but it also tells us the probabilities of being in the money by one penny, all right? So if I have a 16 delta, that means there is a 16% chance the underlying will move and my strike will finish one penny in the money, okay? That's during the life of that option, whether it's 100 days, 50 days, two days, okay? The probabilities are the probabilities of being in the money by one penny at expiration. 
two times that delta is during that life of the option. So I'm 100 days expiration during the life, let's say, you know, during that next 100 days, sometime in that next 100 days, two times that delta is the probability the underlying comes up and smacks me, right? Meaning I've got, say, a $130 call, XYZ is trading 100, that $130 call, let's say it's a 16 delta, I have a 32% probability the underlying during the next 100 days will trade that strike prices, uh, price uh, in the open markets. But only a 16% chance of finishing one penny in the money at expiration, meaning on that day that it expires, all right? So the probabilities of us seeing my strike price trade that strike price two times better than my strike price being in the money at expiration, right? So we're trying to get the probabilities in our favor. Anytime an underlying smacks our strike, that is the key to pull the ripcord, all right? Stay structured, especially in the beginning, getting used to trading options, stay mechanical. I see my strike price trade, I'm out, all right? Especially learning to trade it. Later on, so you can squeeze it out a little bit more, all right? Maybe you're doing uh, two tranches, meaning a two lot, or you know, I don't know if you're a big trader, you're doing 20 lots. Maybe you take tw uh, half of them off uh, when it hits it and let those other ones ride out a little bit, okay? If you feel like you got more room to move, all right? But stay mechanical, stay with that. I beat the probabilities, uh, trade. And that's usually when we've seen our strike price trade. And again, with this one too. All right. So the Delta tells us the probabilities is folks, really, it's just a standard deviation curve. When you enter a trade, it is, they say 50, 50, that it can move higher or 50, 50 chance it can move lower the next day. Right now we are at unchanged. Okay, so what we're trying to do is capture this move outside, all right? We're waiting, we want something to move at least to this point, like come up and hit one standard deviation, which is basically in the money. Uh, here is actually gonna be an 84 delta because that put will be in the money and uh, the out of the money put is going to be a 16 delta, okay? I'll show you that here in a second. How that figures. All right, but let's get the strikes really quickly on the short put butterfly. This is ish, folks. I'm not telling you, you if you can't find an 84 delta in the money option that you don't do this trade or a 50, now, these two strikes are going to be exactly the same. The distance from here to here is going to be the same from here to here, okay? The distance between here and here is the same between here and here, okay? Equal distance. So let's set it up. What I do is I go to the one that is closest to the at the money, you can see we're trading 49. This is the one that's supposed to stay out the money, uh, despite the fact that the delta doesn't reflect that necessarily. Um, so I'm going to go and hit these two right there. Now, my rule of thumb in on this is whatever your collection of credit is, you know, kind of double it and get to that mark. So when I sell, or sorry, when I buy two of these options at the money, right? If I buy two, right? If I bought two of those, that's really $12 in some odd sense, right? Because I got two of them, I have to pay $6 for each of them, so that's right around $12. I say two times that is really where you're gonna go to define your risk. So uh, 25 higher, there, look, it's really close to that 84 delta. 
um, you know, 84 ish Delta is where we're looking for. And I will usually look for the one that is in the money first to get that collection, right? So I went 25 higher, then that means I need to move 25 lower, right? 25 higher, 25 lower, based on that two times the collection of credit there, or $12 times two is 25. We've got that. Or you can look at the 80 ish, 84 Delta. That seems easier for you. Well, you can see it's not always that 16 Delta out of the month. Um, I usually look for that 84 Delta in the money first and then go equal distance down because that one's not always um, that Delta. Okay. Uh, the other thing we have to do is we know it's $25 wide, right? I want to make sure when I'm bi building this out, I'm risking one to make one. All right, risking one to make one. I have $25 wide, really it should be, um, $25 wide, it should really be around $12.50. Well, this is a little bit of gravy. Don't go less than 50%, folks, because this collection of credit is what I get to keep. All right. So you can build this strategy out a lot of times. Right? You can always you can always build this strategy out. It is very difficult to build this strategy out according to this last guideline. Risk it making it to risk one to make one. I want this to be a little bit better than 50-50, okay? Meaning uh, my credit is a little bit better. My reward is a little bit better than my risk in this case, all right? Now, do I think the DraftKings is gonna rally that much or fall flat all the way down to 25? Not necessarily. One of the natures of the beast here is we talked about this is trading 49.82. That's right at the money. That means this is all something that can go away. We're these ones that we're buying. Okay. It's all theta decay. It's all volatility started coming out. These are the premiums we're going to start to see erode faster. These ones that are in the money right here, there's not very much extrinsic value that will erode. Remember, this is the one that is in the money. It has to include. $25 in benefit, right? We're trading $49.82. My option that is in the money, this one in particular, has to include at least $25 and 18 cents, right? $25 and 18 cents. You can see these premiums are over that by 50 cents to over about a dollar. That's what I was telling you folks, if you cover these trades that are in the money, you're leaving money on the table. Or I'm sorry, if you exercise your right on a long put that's in the money, you're leaving that money on the table. You're leaving almost a dollar on the table, which equates to a hundred, okay? So don't do that. <laughs> Get out of the trade. You know, you leave a hundred dollars on the table plus the $35 to exercise your right. Cost you not, it costs you a couple dollars to get out of this trade, nothing to go out there and sell, or sorry, uh, offset that trade, keep that extra $100, and then just go out there and sell your underlying in the open market. Okay? And this is what it's going to look like. Because I built this out where my reward is slightly better for the risk reward. You can see that it's not completely even. It's a little bit better risk reward than normal, all right? Having said that, I am not going to wait for this thing to rally all the way up to 75. Now, if after earnings it happens, I might do that. I, I might be just happy as a pig, but uh, otherwise, I just don't think it's going to make that full move. Uh, another thing with this strategy, the butterflies, any butterfly, even all the way to the iron butterfly, if you hear butterfly, no, they take a lot longer. You have to be a lot more patient with this strategy. It's going to feel like you're in it for a longer period of time. And that's probably because you will be. Okay, so no, the butterfly takes a long time. I mean, it's got to go through this metaphor this or something. I don't know, but they're a different beast. Short butterflies, 
We want that move to happen, but the short butterfly, we want longer duration. Normally we say short, we want near duration to take advantage of theta. But because remember, we're buying these at the money options, you can see I'm buying the two at the money options that we talked about at around that 50-ish delta. That is all theta, okay? That's all extrinsic value that will erode if I'm inside of that 35, 45 days to expiration. It's going to erode quickly. So I need to be a good steward of capital and know that I want to limit my exposure to theta. That means I have to get further out in time like we showed you on those charts and building from simple concepts to real life examples here, right? We started out with a simple concept talking about how that's affecting now we're getting a little bit more finite, digging into the devil at the details. And if you guys are really catching on, like, holy cow, the light bulb is going off, smash that like button for me and share this information. That bot will, you're feeding a bot a cookie to run out and find somebody else to sh share this with. So help that out. Comment all of those things. Feed those bots for me, all right? Um, so... 75 to the upside, 25 to the downside. Something I was wanting to say about this. Uh, if it breaks up there and hits that strike, of course, that is what? The bells and whistles are going off. I've beaten the probabilities. Get out of this trade. All right. Otherwise, you're going to have to hold on to this trade probably to the very last day. And I don't want to see anybody have to hold on to it forever. And when do I get out? I look to get out, this is a defined risk strategy, at 50% of max profit, all right? That's what I'm looking for here. $13, I'm looking at getting out at 50% of that. $13.75, so what do I wanna do when I collect a credit? I wanna sell high and buy low, I wanna buy it back cheaper. So what's 50% of that? I'd say it's probably somewhere around six. I'm just going to say 675. I think that's pretty darn close. It's close enough for government work. I know it's not right on, but that would be if all of a sudden I saw my strategy trading for six, $6.75, that's 50% of ish max prof. All right, that's when I'm pulling the ripcord. All right, if you're setting this up, um, and let's say you set up this strategy and five days have gone by and it just hasn't done anything, you, you can have a time stop on this. I'm pulling the ripcord. I'm just, I'm done. I'm not gonna ride this out. And that would be on a loser. I'd probably uh, look to cover it if it didn't happen right away because I'm looking for a quick move, right? I'm looking for that rubber band to snap and this thing moves. So uh, if it doesn't start happening, well, then my thesis is out the window, okay? So if your thesis changes or anything changes, your gut instinct changes, go with that. Uh, it's your limbic saying, hey, boo, dude, I know you can't understand this, but I'm your limbic. I can process this information faster than anything. Problem is your limbic isn't using a voice. It's deaf. It can only give you these feelings like you're doing something right or wrong. So go with that, um, always. If, you, if there's nothing else you take away with, go with your gut on any trade. Seriously, especially when you first start trading. You can't imagine how much information that part of your brain is, is cranking out. And so go with it. Uh, don't make that mistake of second guessing. So like I said, we're getting out 50% of max profit. Do not ride this into the sunset. All right, 50% of max profit, we're getting out. And that will happen if your short strikes are hit, that will happen. Where is your break even? One thing I do wanna mention here is the break evens. The break even is you take your short strikes and determine your break even from that. So on the call side, it is the 75 strike, which is right here, that 75 strike minus the 1375. Oops, 1375, so that brings the break even that way, right? On the, uh, the actually this is the out of the money 
put, or sorry, the in the money put, sorry, in the money put, uh, the out of the money put, this is that one that's like basically around the 16-ish delta. The out of the money uh, put is basically plus 1375. So anytime you get a credit on a strategy, folks, that credit is an aid, okay? It helps you out with your break-evens. When you buy an option, if I buy a call, I buy a put, that increases, I pay a debit, that increases my break-even uh, parameters, right? It, you know, put side to the downside, call side to the upside um, when you're buying. So those are the, that's how we determine our break evens. You take the credit, subtract from the uh, in the money put, add to the out of the money put. So our break evens come in a little bit, all right? We need to be at least at that point at expiration for our break even. These break even parameters, they, they constantly will adjust, especially with a very intricate strategy like this, because levers and pull, if volatility increases, it will help us with this strategy. The reason why is we talked about this a little bit. Volatility affects further duration options more than the nearer duration options. Just like we talked about with theta. Theta affects, you're saying in your head, the nearer duration. It ramps up, right? Volatility affects further duration options more because there's more unknown. Volatility is associated to the unknown or fear, right? So volatility affects further duration options more and it will affect at the money options more than the further away ones, all right? So when we're buying an option, we're buying that at the money option that is really affected by uh, volatility, we'd like to see that volatility go up right? Because that helps us. <clears throat> and by, it's going to affect those premiums that we sold also. They're going to get inflated as well, but not as much as the at the money options. Okay. We probably can see that if I go back <clears throat> to here, we can see uh, in this column here, Vega, right? It's not going to give me my pen. I'm going to have to go click on it. But if we look at the Vega in this column here, right, further out of the money ones compared to the ones that are right here at, right, uh, and Vega is right here, it's harder to see, but those versus these, right? So the ones I'm buying are gonna get inflated if volatility starts increasing. Um, so that's the ones that I want to see that volatility jack up on, okay? So during the life, even if this underlying doesn't move and doesn't get my directional move, but I see volatility expanding, that will help us in this strategy, all right? We do want to see a big move in either direction. We will benefit from it because if you think about it, I have a short call spread. I have a short, or sorry, short put spread, right? I'm selling a 75 put which is really expensive and I'm buying a 50 put. So this put spread is somewhere like 26, 25, $26, right? Almost the difference there. So that's a lot of premium to pay for my long put spread, which is a 50 put and then selling the 25 put, right? So I pay a debit for this one. This debit is much less than this credit. All right, so this short call spread that's in the money pays for the entire strategy. And that's again why we would rather see this underlying take off to the upside, because I'd like to see that in the money call, or sorry, in the money put, the 75 put go out of the money. Because then if that 75 put is worth zero, I got the most bang for my buck I could, right? That was the most expensive option I collected a credit for. So even if all of the other ones expire worthless and my 75 put expired worthless, that's the one that paid for it, right? So we're happy about that. And, you know, this strategy, if it falls on its face and all of my options are in the money, 
Well, the strategy is still going to work out because my long put spread that was super cheap beforehand is now very expensive. So I bought it cheap, sold it for more, right? Because this would increase in value. This one would end up being worth $25 and this one worth zero, right? So if you guys have any takeaways, please share it with everybody else by smashing that like button. If you have any questions, comments, or anything else, even if you didn't have the opportunity to do it while I was live here today, I will circle back around. I often will find that people are asking questions later on. I will make sure you folks are clear of concept as well. And before you go, please make sure you guys hit that subscribe button. And next to that subscribe button, I'm gonna ask you to do one more step and check out that bell because that bell tells you, hey, Wolfman's going on unannounced. I know you got these schedule announcements. I give you those notifications, but this one's unannounced. I'm not told to give you the unannounced unless you click on the bell. So make sure that bell is also uh, giving you a notification. All right. If you guys enjoyed this at all, I'm going to throw something over here in the chat window to give you guys a link to this. All right. There it is. It might take a second. You guys can click on that. That's a hot link. If not, you're probably going to have to uh, pause, punch this into your URL. That hot link is probably the best way to get onto it. Um, we're giving you all kinds of content for $36. Keep in mind, if I've saved you uh, an option premium that was $0.36, cents, well, option contract multiplier, that's 36 bucks. I just saved you. Listen. I would rather give you this, ed or you would probably rather have this education for $36, 15 hours worth of content alone, plus how to trade that blue uh, thing that I had on a lot of my charts that's called the market profile. So you'd be able to learn to figure out how to set up trades around that, you know, even with Fibonacci's and everything else. It really does work well and incorporate well together. I also try to streamline your process. Make sure you folks are uh, staying mechanical. I don't know why it's, uh, I don't know if that link went through or not. <clears throat> um, I'm getting some kind of thing. And the when, where, and why we should be doing all this stuff. A lot more detail in here, but for 36 bucks, you guys can't go wrong with that. Uh, please take advantage. If you have any questions, comments, or anything else, Please reach out to us at trading at or 310 598 6677. This is a little bit more expanded view of what you get. The other one was a little bit more of an uh, overview. History of options is a really fun one. <clears throat> so uh, take advantage of that. Talking about Aristotle and a couple of folks back in the day. So a uh, little fun stuff to change it up. Again, here's your URL. I just want to say thank you guys all. I do really appreciate you guys joining me for this hour. You guys help me out, create the content. I, I'm looking for you folks to drive this in your direction. I want you guys to take away as much as you can from these videos. So please don't feel like you're asking too many questions. I'm here to answer those questions. I'm trying to get you guys comfortable with this. And the only really way to do that is to have some good back and forth. So I do appreciate you guys participating. And before you go, please smash that like button, feed those bots to go out there and chase down somebody like you, all right? Let's get those bots running. And don't forget to comment. I will come back around and uh, chat you guys up if I see you. But that's all I got for you guys. Appreciate you guys sticking around with me. And I know we Finally got some of those kinks worked out for you today on this video, at least. All right, that's it. Uh, if you can't take that, take it easy. Bye for now.